Good evening. Can everybody hear me? It, it's hard being short behind the podium. I've also had some instructions to try to stay still if I can, and I'm not a person who tends to stand still. So I'd like to thank Camille um, for giving me this opportunity to come and talk with you tonight. I also talked with one of the cohorts uh, a summer or so ago and was supposed to come back this past summer. And then my mother had some health issues and I was not able to come. So I was excited to be able to come back to North Carolina this week to talk to you all and it's also our annual tradition. Even at my age, my mother doesn't know how to put up her Christmas tree. And so I, wherever I am, I always get to travel back to North Carolina to make sure that she has a tree. So tomorrow, that's how I will be spending my Friday, is trying to find a place to put up her Christmas tree. So it's, it's a, exciting to be able to, um, to do the work that I love to do and also to be able to do it at home. So thank you for the invitation. I also wanted to start just by acknowledging the indigenous Indigenous people on whose land we're on um, and recognizing it's primarily the Lumbee but also recognizing the other tribes of this area and I was struck it's not often that I get to Pembroke but my family is from Clinton so about an hour away and I was struck as I was driving here this afternoon that I had not seen the sign that says welcome to Pembroke and it has tribe university um, and community and I wanted to take a sign of that for my own institution where I'm at now but I wanted to make sure that we recognize the indigenous people and I always make a point of telling people that for me and, and what I'm talking about tonight is a lot about stories but for me I also always try to tell the story of my daughter journey um, my daughter Journey is nine. We adopted her when she was a day old, and I'm Kahari, but my daughter is from the Cheyenne and Arapaho nations from Oklahoma. And so we got a call that she was being born the morning that she was being born, and about six hours later, we were on a plane to go and get our baby um, in Oklahoma. So if anybody thinks that it's um, impossible or difficult to learn how to be a parent, learn how to do it with six hours notice. And all we had was a car seat and the book, everything you need to know about a baby. And so that was my introduction to being a parent. But I, t I share that story because now I teach at Colorado State University and I'm the director of the School of Education there. And the, the university is situated on the traditional lands of the Cheyenne and Arapaho nations, along with the Ute and the Ute Mountain people. And my daughter is Cheyenne and Arapaho. And so each day when I'm on that institution, the lands of that institution, I'm reminded that our lives in many ways have come full circle, that the lands on which my institution are built were built based on the forceful removal and relocation of my daughter's people. And today we have the opportunity to raise her on those lands. And so each time I walk on the, the lands of that institution, I have this love-hate relationship because I love dearly being a faculty member, but I'm also reminded each day that I do the work that I do at the cost of the land and the life and the history and the culture and the language of my daughter's people. And I think in many ways, UNC Pembroke is able to operate at the expense of land and life and language and culture of the Lumbee people. And at the same time, the, the continued existence, right, and the strength of the Lumbee people are in many ways very much tied to this institution. And so I just say that as a way of recognizing the work that we do and the lands on which we do that work. So uh, Camille has asked me to, to give a short talk, and I, I like to tell people that um, I have something planned, but we'll see how it goes. I was raised Baptist and then transitioned to a holiness church. And if you've ever been to a holiness church, you know you're in trouble when you go to Sunday service and the pastor says, my intention is to keep it short today and that I, won't, I don't want to come and tarry long. And then you know you're going to be there till like three o'clock because there's going to be a really long message and you never know where it's going to go. And that, that's kind of how I am. My intention is not to keep you long and to keep it short, but you never know where the spirit might move me. So we'll, we'll see how this goes. And I've never given this particular talk before. Um, so we'll, we'll play with it, right? And I'll just ask for your patience. But the title of it is Rewriting History, Centering Indigenous Cultures and Stories to Create a More Relevant and Appropriate Education for Our Children. And I'm, I'm playing with that term rewriting. I don't use write, like W-R-I-T-E, because there is a sense that we do have to rewrite our stories, right? We do have to, to redo um, and fix history books and textbooks, 
But we also have an opportunity to make sure that the rights that were taken away from us as indigenous peoples, that those rights are given back to us. And a way that we do that is by telling our stories in ways that are authentic and true to us. And so I'm playing with that term rewriting. And you'll see that stories play central in the title of this, um, of this talk. So I wanted to start with a quote um, by a Lumbee person, Dr. Helen Shearbeck, and I found this. I mean, I've read about her um, over the years, but I was preparing for this presentation and I found this quote from an article that she wrote um, back in, I think, 1981, but it was republished in 86, and the article is called Confronting the Continuing Dilemma. And I know you can all can read, but I'll just read this to you um, quickly. She says that from the earliest days of colonization through the founding of the Republic up to the present, American society has been unable or unwilling to recognize or acknowledge the diversity and differences among American Indian peoples and tribes. Both private and public viewpoints have assumed that American Indians were a homogenous people, a single race with many names, which indicated, like the European society from which the Americans came, political subdivisions rather than real cultural and historical distinctions. And she says, Americans have sought to assimilate Indian tribes into the social conglomerate. And she would go on to argue that the American society has strived to do that without fully understanding who we are, right? And I think that again speaks to the importance of stories and people knowing who we are, where we come from, and that we still exist. And so a little bit more about the importance of stories. I draw on the work of a Maori woman. I've done quite a bit of work. I've lived in New Zealand, studied in New Zealand, work with students there. Linda Tahiwe Smith is a New Zealand Maori woman who's written a book, Decolonizing Methodologies, some of you may have read. And she has a quote in there that, that speaks to me. She says, it's extremely rare and unusual when, and she doesn't capitalize indigenous, but I do, and I would encourage all of you to use that as a forceful, as a form of resistance to, to capitalize who we are. But she says it's extremely rare and unusual when indigenous accounts are accepted and acknowledged as valid interpretations of what has taken place. And yet the need to tell our stories remains the powerful imperative of a powerful form of resistance. And so if you leave with nothing else tonight, I'd like for you to leave with the question of how are you going to use your story or your stories as a powerful form of resistance? And I would argue that the schools in which many of you work or plan to work or where your children attend school, that those are spaces that are contested spaces and spaces in which we need to work and to serve as a powerful form of resistance, right? a resistance that recognizes that schools were not built for people like us, nor were they built by people like us. Schools and the, the, the whole process of schooling was built with the intention, if you go back to the work of people like Richard Henry Pratt, who started Carlisle um, Indian Boarding School in Pennsylvania, schooling, the American schooling system for American Indians and Native people was designed and built with the intent to acculturate, assimilate, and ultimately to kill us. They were not designed to sustain us, to sustain our cultures, our languages, our ways of being, or to sustain us as physical beings. That's a pretty powerful statement, right? It's a powerful statement to say, and yet many of us send our children to those schools, those very institutions that were not built to sustain or to honor us. And yet we do this work, right? And, and Camille read the, the quote where I say that my family knew that I was destined to be an educator long before I did because I swore that I would never be a teacher. There was no way that I would ever set foot in a classroom. And part of that was because I grew up I'm in an area where there was maybe one native teacher that I knew my entire schooling experience. And the, the only person that I really knew was our title, nine, at that time, Title IX or Title IV Indian ed person, who was not a certified teacher, but a teaching assistant. And schooling was not a place that recognized for me who I was or the potential that I had. And my mother often tells this story that I wanted to go to West Point to the military academy, even though I have no athletic ability at all. Um, I went to my guidance counselor and the guidance counselor would not help me get a nomination. 
I eventually went on to get an, an alternate nomination to West Point and then didn't go. But I did it because my family and people around me supported me and helped me to get the materials together, not because my school supported that. And that's just one of many examples of the school not recognizing that I was going to college. It wasn't a question of was I going, it was a question of where I was going, right? But a lot of that was really rooted and grounded and seated in my family and my community and not in schools. And so I thought, why would I want to be a teacher and, and reproduce a system that was not warm and welcoming for me or my family or my community? Why would I want to be a part of that? And then I graduated from Appalachian State with an undergraduate degree in history, Latin American history of all things, not the most employable field. And my parents said, we love you dearly, but you need to get a job um, and you need to get a job quickly. And so I got encouraged to go into education and ended up working um, with the Title IX or Title IV Indian Ed program in Cumberland County with Ms. Trudy Locklear and worked with her in 13 different junior and middle schools for a year and realized I don't do well with junior high students. Um, there's too many hormones and emotions and other things going on. And then I went to work at a community college and then had an opportunity to go to Penn State to work on my master's degree in an American Indian, especially a teacher training program, then came back to North Carolina, taught high school special ed with students with behavioral and emotional um, disorders and learning disabilities, and then was recruited back to Penn State for my doctoral degree and then left there and went to work with tribal colleges and then was recruited back to Penn State as a faculty member. And so for me, it was not me having this story or the story about wanting to be an educator, but every time I tried to run from being an educator, a door was open and an opportunity was created and I followed those opportunities. And for me, it is, I can't think of anything that bring, other than my daughter, that brings me any greater joy um, or fulfillment than being an educator and being a scholar. And I would not have said that as a high school graduate, right? That I did not want to be a part of that educational system, but every day I get paid to wake up and to think about education and to get to think about how we can ensure that our beautiful little ones have a better, better educational experience than I had or than my parents had. And I can't think of anything that I could be any more blessed to do than that. And so I, I would really applaud all of you who are going on that journey and who have that blessing of being able to shape the hearts and minds of our little ones, because there is no greater calling than to do that work. Um, and so you just see my timeline here. A lot of this is covered in this. I, I often define myself first as my connection to my tribe and being Kahari and what that means and oftentimes what it doesn't mean, right? And then I list myself next as being mom or mommy or when my daughter's mad, mom or um, you know, a partner and a wife to my husband, Lee, a, a daughter to my parents, a sister to my, to my sister, Lori, and an auntie to my niece, Kanani. And so those are the roles that are most important to me. And then my role as a professor and as the director of the School of Education, former director of a leadership program for American Indian and Alaska Native students. And then I talk a lot about my work that I've had opportunities to live and work in New Zealand with deaf Maori students, to, to work in, um, in Ethiopia at Addis Ababa University working with um, Ethiopian doctoral students. And then I've had this opportunity over the last few years to do to do work with students who are being pushed out, and I use pushed out rather than dropped out, but students who are being pushed out of schools. I've also had opportunities to work with early childhood longitudinal studies, so doing a lot of quantitative data analysis with large scale data sets. And then most recently, I've been able to go back to East Carolina Indian School, which is the Indian school that my parents graduated from. And what was supposed to be a summer project has now morphed into something that's going into about year six or seven, where I've been interviewing and videotaping the histories and stories of those remaining teachers and students who went to school at East Carolina Indian School. And one of the most special of those um, interviews has been with a woman um, who was a teacher there and was in her 90s and had Alzheimer's and I got her on a day that she remembered being a teacher at that school and recently passed away. And so I have those histories and trying to figure out what to do with them. And the two people that I haven't interviewed have been my parents. Um, 
and and they keep saying we're ready to talk to you and i've said i don't think i'm ready right to hear those stories and so i feel very blessed to be able to do those things and to have that as a part of my story and then again you can see this is a kind of a depiction of those things that i hold dearly and so you can see the picture here was at my parents 50th wedding anniversary my husband um in the back is Lee, my daughter, when she was a little younger, my sister and her daughter, and then my dad. And then in the middle, you can see me and my daughter. And then on the end, you might see something familiar, is that's me with a group of scholars at a recent conference, but I'm holding a shawl, and on it you can see the, the pine cone patchwork that one of my most recent doctoral students was Marcus Collins, who's from this area. I was not Marcus's chair, but I was on his committee, and he gifted me with that when he graduated. And so I, I did a presentation a couple weeks ago and it was about our ancestors and I took that with me because I was saying even though that's not my tribe that there's a lot of ancestry there a lot a lot of history and a lot of connections that remind me of who I am and why I do this work uh, Tiffany's in the back I was on her doctoral committee you know Tiffany didn't always like everything I had to say right and, and we butted heads at time and I reminded her that the work that you're doing is about more than you it's about more than being an academic but there are so few Native scholars, and our work will be read, and it will be picked apart in ways that non-Native scholars' work will not be. And so we do the work that we do for our communities and our people and our ancestors, and not so much for UNC Pembroke or for the Academy, but for those who came before us. And so that's, that's my, my story, right? And so I, I also want to remind you, though, that and you may, may be saying, why is she talking about stories? What does this have to do with culturally responsive leadership or strong leadership? I think it has everything to do with it. Because if we don't know who we are, then how can we know where we're going? And how can we help our students get where they need to go? And there are so many things in the ways in which schools are structured that are antithetical to who we are as Native people. And so we have to know who we are and we have to understand why we do the work that we do and how our culture and our stories guide that work. I would also argue though that there's a video and I, I typically show one by um, Adiche, which is about the, pow the danger of a single story, but I've used that a lot. So if the video will play, I'm gonna show you a different clip. But Adiche says that the single story creates stereotypes and the problem with stereotypes is not that they're untrue, but that they're incomplete. And they make one story become the only story. And so why do I say that? Because this time of year, just ending November, seems to be the one time of year when educators wanna talk about Native people. And typically they wanna present us as wearing paper feathers and headbands and, and um, you know outfits made out of bags from Piggly Wiggly or whatever. And so, you know, this, this story, and if any of you question that, if you're on Twitter, go to my Twitter account. My um, Twitter handle is at sfaircloth12. And over the last month, I've been pulling every example of these stereotypes and images that I can find of teachers in schools dressing kids up in paper feathers and headbands. And I've been adding at every one of those schools with an article from Teaching Tolerance or an article about why it's dangerous to do this. I've had a few that have blocked me. I've had a few that have responded back and said, we're not doing anything wrong. I've had a few that have said, we never thought about that. Um, and a couple who are engaging me in a conversation. So I'm not saying that to promote my Twitter handle, but saying that if you wanna see how we're being portrayed, go to Facebook or go to Twitter, and it's not pretty. And I'll give you an example of that. So another person says, there is no single story spun on a single tongue. And she's talking about African Americans, but if I can get this to play, it's about two minutes, and I think she speaks powerfully to the danger of these single stories. So, so the point of that was to demonstrate again the danger of having this single story about who we are, this stereotypical notion of who we are, and that we really need to be careful about that um, and thinking about what are our stories and that we have multiple different stories. So here's an example of a dangerous story, right? So this, this, video, this picture is one of the, the most egregious examples that I found on Twitter as I did this search to prepare for this presentation. 
And I was getting ready to take, my, my husband and I were married on Thanksgiving Day, and so we were going away for the Thanksgiving holiday and our anniversary. And I found this image along with three other images from a school in Tennessee the day before we were getting ready to go on our trip. And when I saw this image, my heart sank, right? Um, and so I tweeted at, at this, the school and said to them, please rethink this. And, and understand the damage that you are doing, not only to Native children, but to those children who sit in the classroom and think that this is what we look like and this is how we act. And rather than that school responding back to me, they immediately took the photos down. Now, fortunately, because I wanted to be an FBI agent before I wanted to be a teacher, I fought enough to save the image, right? And so I, I had it there and I know where the school is, I didn't repost the image because, first of all, I didn't know what good that would do, and second of all, it really tra it was traumatizing to me to see this image, and so I didn't want to traumatize others by having this. But I but I sat with this image for several days, and then I asked my husband to blur out their faces because if you saw them on Twitter, you would see their actual faces. I asked him to blur them out, and you're the first group that I've shared this with. But this is probably the least offensive of the four, four photos that they shared. And these were elementary teachers. And this is how they're teaching children about Native people. So if you want to think about the, the power of stories and the importance of stories, think about that one. What story does that image tell about who we are and how we are and how we live and what we do? It's a story about savagery, right, about tomahawk warring and killing and is that the is that is that image accurate or appropriate that's a question right and then there's the question that for me is what's the pedagogical intent or purpose of showing these images and so when i tweet at schools now i'm asking them that that question what is the cultural um what is the cultural purpose of doing this and that this is culturally and pedagogically inappropriate right because for me I can talk as a Native person about the impact and how damaging this is, and I can get charged with being overly emotional. But what I want people to understand is I've got hundreds of years of scholarship that tell me that this is not just culturally inappropriate, but it's pedagogically inappropriate. And so if people don't want to listen to, I'm a Native person and I know this is wrong, if they don't want to hear that story, then let me speak to them as an educated Native woman who's got three degrees and who studies this and can point to literature that says this is not pedagogically appropriate, right? So we, we have to figure out which one of our tools and which one of our stories people will understand and listen to. So my question to you is, what are your stories? What are our stories? And how are we gonna use those um, in our leadership work? And when I think about the stories of the Lumbee people or the stories of indigenous peoples of North Carolina or the Southeast, I think that there's stories of perseverance, stories of persistence, and stories of resistance, right? And I think that it's our charge as educators, how do we undo these deficit stories? Everything is wrong with us, right? We come from impoverished communities. We come from racially charged communities. We come from uneducated communities. We come from communities of strength. We come from communities that have persisted and existed and resisted in spite of 500 years attempt, sustained attempts to acculturate, assimilate, and ultimately to kill us. How much stronger can you get than when we can persist and resist and exist in the face of that, right? So that's the story that I want us as educators to tell is one of per perseverance, even though I can't hardly spell the word, right? but one of perseverance, one of persistence, and one of resistance. And this is a quote from a Greensboro paper that said, the tendency of Indian people to coalesce into new communities, to adopt or adapt Indian people from other decimated tribes, to hold on to their identity as Indians and not to surrender it, even though they had to speak English and dress in a European style to survive. This tendency resulted in the presence of the very Lumbee community today. And perhaps the most remarkable thing about the Lumbee is that we are still here, right? And I would say that same thing about the seven other tribes of North Carolina, that in spite of having to in many ways acculturate and live a more dominant lifestyle, 
that we have maintained a sense of who we are and that that is a powerful form of resistance. That is strength, right? And so how do we get schools to understand that? How can we celebrate Thanksgiving? How can we talk about Indian history? Because the question that I'm asking schools is, I don't want you not to talk about Native people, but can you talk about us without dressing us up in a brown paper bag? Like, if you can give me the pedagogical teaching instructional relevance of putting a paper bag on kids and paper feathers, then you can convince me that that's right. But I don't see any evidence that, that you can't teach about us and with us in appropriate ways. So how, the question then I would ask you is, how do we want our stories to be told? Um, there was a story, and I won't play this video because I want to get to the end, there's a story recently about the public schools of Robinson County and your tribal chairman is talking in this interview where you, children were brought to an area and were exposed to Lumbee cultures, right? Those are stories, those are ways in which children can see that we exist, we persist, we resist, we are still here today, and we can talk about our history. But you know, the question I ask schools is, can you not engage with local tribes? Can you not invite them in? Can you not go out into communities? There are ways in which to situate us in the present. So again, I would ask you, how do you want our stories to be told? And then I did some a quick review of Facebook pages of some of the schools in Robinson County. And I share with you three images or two images that I found, this very powerful one of young people speak together, with, rock their mocks with their moccasins together. That's a powerful image. I'm okay, you wanna teach kids to make moccasins, right? We wear those. Do you wanna teach that? Show those images. And then I found an image of, you know, your, your um, tribal princesses in regalia, not costumes, but regalia. Those are stories, those are images that present a very powerful and accurate story. And then I look at my own airport in Denver that I travel through quite often and I see this photo that's painted on the wall. And I think this is who native people are. We're preachers and teachers and lawyers and doctors and nurses, mothers, aunties, grandmas, grandpas, mothers, fathers, homemakers. This is who we are. And none of us are wearing brown paper bags, right? Or paper feathers. So there are many different notions or stories or conceptions of who we are and how we are. Our challenge is to tell those stories and to tell them in an accurate way. And so I go back then to the work of Melinda Maynard Lowry in her book, The Lumbee Indians and American Struggle. And she says that any project on American Indian history begins with recovering the words, the sentences, and the stories that have been erased. And what do we do? We uncover and recover and hold on to those stories and those images and those words, and we use them as a powerful form of resistance to tell our stories and to sustain our stories. Now, I gave a presentation at my own institution when I first went there last year, and a student just emailed me a couple of weeks ago because in that presentation, I made the statement that there are bits and pieces of us as Native people that don't belong to you as non-Natives. It is not your right to have access to those stories or to that knowledge or that history or that culture. And I don't have an obligation to share that with you, nor do you have a right to encroach and demand that we share that with you or invite you in. The student just emailed me back and said, I'm confused by that because I want to be an ally, but how can I be an ally when you're telling me that I don't have a right to your stories? I don't know how to respond to that student because I want to say to him, you know, you can't be an ally if I don't ask you to be an ally, right? I mean, it's, it's not like we're out just asking you to be them. Like there's a certain inviting in. And what I wanted him to understand is it's not that you can't ask us questions or shouldn't ask us questions, but you should not be so privileged that you think that you have a right to our culture, right? A right to our language, a right to our story, a right to our histories. That's a very privileged westernized notion of culture and what it means and your right to have it. And I think that we as Native people have a right to determine what others have access to. And we as Native educators have a right, and if we go back to the Educational Assistance and Self-Determination Act of the 1970s, what it said in there is part of our move to self-determination is the right to determine the educational futures for our children and our communities, which means we have a right to determine the ways in which our children are educated. We have a right to have Native history taught and to have it taught accurately. Other people 
don't have that same right because we have a different social, legal, political history with the U.S. government, even for those of us who are not federally recognized. It's different. I need to tell that student that, but I'm not quite sure how to tell it, right? And then Melinda goes on in her book to tell the story about her daughter, you know, Lydia, and to talk about our daughters are about the same age. And so, you know, we know each other through Facebook and Twitter and occasionally see each other. And we talk about the difficulties of raising young Native um, women, right? And how we do that when we don't live in our own indigenous Native communities. And how do we, you know, I struggle with how do I teach my daughter to be a strong Cheyenne Arapaho woman when I'm not Cheyenne and Arapaho and we don't live in our, in our, in our community. How do I do that? That's a real struggle to be able to teach her how to do that when I don't speak my own Native language. But we do have stories that we can share and we can talk about our strengths and the importance of culture and language. And so then I would leave you with, with what I think are some really critical questions. Number one, what stories have been erased from our histories or from your histories? What stories have been erased from our schools? And I want you to leave here understanding that the fact that our stories are absent or that our stories are incorrect in school is not an act of happenstance. It's a forceful act to retell and to restory our stories. Everybody get that? It doesn't just happen. It's a purposeful act to do this. And so we have to think, how do we resist? And how do we make sure that our stories are, are there and that they're accurate? I would also ask you to ask, what are the stories that need to be told? Are there stories that are burning within your soul and within your person that need to be told? And how are you going to tell those stories and tell those stories with care? Um, and I'll share just a quick story with you. I know I'm near the end of my time. I, when I was at a conference a couple weeks ago, the conference that I had, the Shaw from Marcus Collins, I read an excerpt from my grandmother's eulogy. Both of my grandmothers passed within about two years of each other. And I got to, um, to, to read a eulogy at both of their, their funerals. Both of my grandmothers passed away in their 90s, one at 97 and one around 96. And so when my first grandmother passed, um, my husband said to me, my husband's not a very religious person, but he said to me, you could do like Jesus did in the garden of, of Gethsemane, and you could say, let this cup pass, you know. And I, I said, but just like Jesus, I can't let this cup pass because I have an obligation to tell my grandma's story. And so I tell this story about her that my grandma never drove a car. She never took me to an amusement park. She wasn't one who put me on her lap and held me. Um, she wasn't like this overly emotional person, but she was the person who every Saturday night would let me sit by her and watch her roll out chicken, um, chicken and pastry dough. And she would let always save me a little bit of the biscuit dough because I like raw biscuit dough. And she would always fix communion and she would save me a little bit of the grape juice. And I love grape juice. And she taught me to sew. And she also taught me there were certain things we didn't do on Sundays, right? She was the one that... Um, when I was sick, she always had a little bit of um, hot lemon and honey and butter and Jim Beam or some other hard, you know. And my grandma was not a drinker, but there was some hard liquor in it. And it would sweat out whatever was wrong with you. And so I tell people she made Robitussin before Robitussin was there. And, you know, grandma was also that person that, you know, when my heart hurt, that I could go to her and she could pray and she could make it better. She was the one who, when I needed clothes and didn't have money, she'd give me her Cato's card, and we would charge something at Cato's. Or she was the one who could make dinner for you know 20 people out of one chicken and a bag of potatoes. She knew how to do those things. She knew what it meant to be Kahari. And when she died, and my mom said to me, you know, who who will pray for us now? And that broke my heart because we that was the question. She was the one who had that spiritual and that cultural knowledge, and she was gone. And who was going to intercess for us? Who was going to be that connection? And so, you know, I honor her by telling her story that she didn't have a high school degree. She didn't drive. She didn't have much. But she knew who she was. And she reminded us of how important that was, how important our stories were. And rooted and grounded us in our culture. And so that's an important story that I have to share and that I pass on. What are the stories that you need to tell? I would also ask you the question, who gets to tell these stories, right? And that not everybody has the right or the ability to tell these stories. Who gets to determine who tells our stories? 
What are the stories that are being told? Why are they being told? And are these stories accurate? How do we change the narrative that's being told about us, not just in schools, but outside of schools? What stories will we tell? And how will we use our stories as a powerful form of resistance? I think that's a really critical question as educational leaders, future leaders, is that you have within you much more than Camille or or Zoe or anybody else can teach you in the academic program at UNC Pembroke about leadership. You have cultural knowledge and wealth in your communities. You can take your children to the rivers and talk to them about the seasons. You can take them to powwows. You can take them to cultural centers. You can take them to elders, take them to the Piggly Wiggly, right? You, there's so much to be taught about leadership and what it means to lead in a culturally relevant way that is not written in a textbook and that you will not read it in a journal article. Those are stories that we need to capture and we need to hold on to and we need to use those stories as a most powerful form of resistance to ensure that 20 years from now or 10 years from now we're not telling the same stories of academic deficits, right? That we're telling about our schools and about our children today because we have a very powerful form of resistance. We have perseverance, we have the ability to persist, and we have the ability to be resilient and to be strong in the face of hundreds of years of attempts to assimilate, acculturate, and ultimately kill us off. So how are you gonna use those stories as a form of resistance? What stories are you gonna tell? What stories are you going to help your children um, and your students unlearn? And what stories are you going to tell people you do not have the right to tell those stories because those stories are wrong and they're not your stories to tell? So I would just leave you with that challenge. Use your stories, tell them wisely, and make sure that those stories are passed on and that they're stories that uplift and speak to the cultural wealth that we have within our communities and that serve to debunk the stories that we are people who are not doing well that we are people who are not strong because I can't think of a people who are any stronger than our people. And those are the stories that need to be told and celebrated. So thank you.